distinguished guests, uh, dear colleagues and friends. Uh, we have the great pleasure and honor today to have uh, Jürgen Kocka present. Jürgen is actually here during three months as a guest of the principal, and I'm very happy that you accepted the invitation. There are many other, uh, several others, very distinguished historians here, so we have a little group of historians, not for the first time, but and hopefully not for the last time. Uh, many of you, most of you, I think, know Jürgen Kocka and his work quite well, so I shall not dwell endlessly on that, but I feel obliged, and it's a great pleasure, to mention a few words about Jürgen Kocka. Uh, he studied internationally already very early. I mean, he's, you were actually taking a master's degree at the, the oldest state university in the United States, the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, in close proximity to what later became uh, the site of the National Humanities Center. But Jürgen Kocka received his doctorate at the Free University Berlin and the Habilitation at Münster. Subsequently, he was professor at, at uh, the University of Bielefeld, which of course is a gigantic modern mass university, but from, that from the very start, the idea was that you should show that in such a setting, you could have a very lively, vital institution. And a key component of that, a small but not unessential, inessential component, was the establishment of something that in German is abbreviated CIF, uh, which in English translation will be the Center for Interdisciplinary Research. And Jürgen Kocka was for a number of years one of the directors of that institution and did very important work, for instance, on Bildungsbürgertum in that respect. Um, at that time, Bielefeld was certainly one of the most important sites for modern historical research in Europe with not only Jürgen Kocka, but hans Ulrich Wiele, Reinhard Koselleck, and a range of other scholars uh, being professors at that university. After that, Jürgen Kocka took up a professorship at the Free University in Berlin uh, in modern the history of the industrial world. So it was a global comparative orientation to the professorship. And during that time, he also became a permanent member of our sister institute in Berlin, the Wissenschaftskolleg zu Berlin. A little bit later, in two, I have to check the exact date, I would guess 2005, um, Jürgen Kocka became the president of what was then the largest institution for social science research in Europe, and is still a very major institution, where he this is the Wissenschaftszentrum Berlin für Sozialforschung. Science Center Berlin doesn't really <laughs> cover what it's all about. So if you think of the Institute for Social Research here in Sweden and multiply it with 20 or 30 or something like that, you will approach what it is all about. It's just, during Jürgen Kocka's presidency and before that also, this building is housed very centrally in Berlin, next to the uh, new National Gallery and the Berlin Philharmonie and the State Library. Um, during that time, he conducted many important research projects, including research on civil society and global history also to some extent. And I think he achieved what had ne not been there before, a much stronger historical orientation within uh, the field of uh, the, not only the activities of the Science Center Berlin, but in promoting closer links between the social sciences at large and historical research. In 2009, Jürgen Kocka retired formally, but that certainly did not slow down his uh, scholarly pace. Uh, and I will have to be very brief, really, and say one or two words what he has done. Actually, before that, I should mention he ha held some very important posts, of course, import including the post as chairman of the International Commission of Historical Sciences. That is what in other fields probably would have been called the International Historical Association, but that is the key professional association of historians in the world. He also took up the position as vice president of the Berlin Brandenburgische Akademie der Wissenschaften, which is a successor of an academy that goes back to Leibniz time, 
For a while it was the Prussian Academy and it has had various other names during these hundreds of years. But Jürgen Kocka is also one of the initiators of the Berlin School of Comparative History, which is a joint institution for the, or was a joint institution for the Free University and the Humboldt University. Currently, he is a permanent fellow at the International Research Center Work and Human Life Cycle in Global History at the Humboldt University. And I should say this is an institution with which we have quite close links. The director of that institution, Andriad Eckert, who was my guest here last spring. And it is an institution which is called in Germany one of the Kitte Hamburger colleagues. That was one of the good inventions, I would say, that the um, uh, then the Christian Democratic Minister of Education and Research at that time, Annette Chavan, introduced. She later had to, as you know, step down from that position concerning unclarities about her doctoral degree. But she, this was a very important initiative, and there are 10 such centers. They are university-based, they are time-limited to two times six years, and they combine, in a sense, programs of visiting scholars with a research program for, proper. I mean, the Institute for Advanced Study is mainly a facilitator of research, shouldn't have large research programs, although they can be there, of course, also. But uh, I think the, the Kette Hamburger colleagues, the originally they were called Geisteswissenschaftliche colleagues, and uh, is an extremely important invention, and it's, I'm, I'm sometimes surprised that Swedish politicians and policymakers have not learned more from the German example than they have. But that, this is one thing I think that would have been very useful to learn a little bit more about. We, there are 10 such colleagues, and we have very close relationships with three of them, apart from this, not least the one that is headed by Erika Fischer-Licht in Berlin on theater science and performan performan performance, performativity, and the one in Erlangen, directed by Michael Lackner, with a comparative civilizational analysis with a strong focus on the Far East. Apart from being associated with this Kette Hamburger colleague, Jürgen Kocka is also a, a senior fellow at the Center for Research and Contemporary History in Potsdam, the Zentrum für Zeithistorische Forschung. And actually, you were one of the initiators of that as well, which is a very important institution for history of, of the contemporary, city, contemporary history of Europe. I should not mention all the visiting professorships Jürgen Kocka has held. There are many including positions at Harvard, Chicago, Jerusalem, Budapest, and so Oxford, and so on. But I would like to mention that you have been a fellow at several of our sister institutions. I mentioned, um, I should mention uh, that you've been a fellow at the Institute for Advanced Study, Princeton, the Center for Advanced Study in the Behavioral Sciences at Stanford, the Netherlands Institute for Advanced Study, Humanities and Social Sciences, and, uh, and a number of other institutions, but some of our closest um, sister institutions. And you have many doctoral degrees, and I will not mention them either, but one important one, since I see Rolf Torstendal in front of me, is Uppsala. I think you, to some extent, was uh, the perpetrator in that respect. And I see Tamara on the side, so Argagau is another one of these. <laughs> and there are many others, but I will not take up too much time. And it's not surprising that he has held prominent positions in a rather large number of academies. He's a member of many of them also, including the Academia Europea, um, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, the Leopoldina, that's the National Academy of Germany. And I would like to mention, though, that you are a recipient of the Holberg Prize. I'm going next week to the session when we will choose this year's winner of the Holberg Prize. But this is actually one of the two largest prizes in the social science and humanities in the world, and you were relatively early winner of this prize. So we were very proud with our small association with you that you were a winner. The Collegium here has had the pleasure of have interacting with Jürgen Kocka, I think for in one way or the other for its whole existence. And we have profited immensely from your good advice and your engagement, and we hope to do so in the years to come. The reason why you're here in scholarly terms is that you will follow up on a book Jürgen Kocka has, of course, written very much on the history of modern Germany and history of modern Europe. First major work was on the Siemens uh, Betrieb, 
but he's written a lot about class formation, civil society and dictatorship, war, but also gone back to the key questions of the history of capitalism. So in 2013, you came out with a small book on the history of capitalism, Geschichte des Kapitalismus, which then subsequently has come out, I think, in three editions in Germany, in German, and it's been translated to a number of languages. The, American, the English edition was print, um, published by Princeton in 2015 or 16. And the reason, and this is a slim but very elegant book, and Jürgen Kocka has now embarked on a major study, extending it, deepening it, and we are very happy that you are the place where you pursue these reflections. I should perhaps also mention that you play a prominent role in the public sphere, and just last week, I think it is, you published a major review in the Tagesspiegel on contemporary literature on Marx, including a Gareth Stedman Jones' huge biography of Marx, which I'm currently reading myself. But it's a great delight that you're here, and I shouldn't take more of your time, but we, I think we should properly welcome you with an applause. Well, <clears throat> thank you very much, Björn, for this uh, very kind uh, introduction, which placed my career, career to a certain extent in the institutional development of uh, our field. And um, yes, I'm honored and uh, delighted to be here as the guest of the principal in this uh, institution, which I have uh, been uh, uh, familiar with uh, since the mid-80s, and I could observe its uh, tremendous development as a most successful institution. By the way, I just heard about a conversation among people who have visited several uh, institutes for advanced study outside the country. And there was the question, which is the most beautiful institute for advanced study? And I think the vote was this one. And if you look on this hall, you understand why. So I'm very glad to be here. Capitalism and its critics, um, a long-term view. <clears throat> the concept capitalism is much younger than the historical reality it denotes. While the concepts capital and uh, capitalist are older, the noun capitalism did not emerge before the second half of the 19th century. The French socialist Louis Blanc used it in 1850 and defined it critically as appropriation of capital by some to the exclusion of others. In 1872, the German socialist Wilhelm Liebknecht um, thundered against uh, capitalism as a juggernaut on the battlefields of industry. And in Britain, the Fabian, uh, John Hobson, critique of imperialism, it was one of the first to use the concept in the 1890s. But it didn't take long before capitalism moved beyond its initially critical and polemical use, becoming a central concept of social sciences. To this German authors uh, like Albert Schäffle, Werner Sombart, Max Weber, and in the Marxian tradition, Rudolf Hilferdink contributed much. Karl Marx, by the way, of course, had written a lot about the capitalist mode of production and capitalist accumulation, but he rarely used the, the noun capitalism, and if so, only marginally. Presently, the concept is in again, particularly among historians and particularly in the English-speaking world. In the American Historical Association's State of the Field volume, American History Now, uh, history of capitalism stands alongside established subfields like women's history or cultural history. And a recent front page article in the New York Times carried the headline, In History Classes, Capitalism Sees Its Stock 
uh, saw. And also in public debates and in some social sciences, the concept is frequently used, much less, however, by economists. Today I want to take serious that the concept uh, emerged in Europe before moving to other parts of the world. And I will take serious that the concept originated as a central concept of social criticism as well as of scholarly analysis. A double meaning, double function, it has maintained, at least with some authors, up to the present time. We will speak about the strange interplay uh, between capitalism and capitalism critique as a European phenomenon I will paint with a very broad brush. While the concept capitalism became broadly used uh, not before the second half of the 19th century, those who have been using it mm, ever since did not doubt that it could be also applied to phenomena in periods of the past when the concept did not yet exist. I share this conviction. As merchant capitalism, capitalism existed already in the first millennium of our calendar. For instance, in, in parts of Arabia, in uh, China, Europe, though mostly in just in the form of capitalist islands in a sea of predominantly non-capitalist relations. In the form of finance capitalism, capitalism has existed at the latest since the high medieval period in some parts of Europe, beginning in northern Italy, later moving its center to Antwerp and Amsterdam and finally London. In the late medieval uh, and early modern period, South, West, and East European agrarian capitalism, as well as plantation capitalism overseas, have shaped our image of capitalism as a system of uh, repressive domination and exploitation, even violence. And all that happened before industrial, before industrial capitalism, starting first from England in the 18th century, then from Europe and North America, became the decisive driving force of capitalist expansion globally. In the present era of globalization, these different types of capitalism still coexist and um, interact. When sketching such a scenario, I presuppose a definition of capitalism, which is narrower than market economy, but broader than industrial capitalism based on wage work en masse. I want to emphasize uh, decentralization, commodification, and accumulation as basic characteristics of capitalism. On the one hand, it is essential that individual and collective actors dispose of property rights, um, <clears throat> which enable them to make economic decisions in a relatively autonomous and decentralized uh, way. On the other hand, market uh, serves uh, as the main mechanisms of allocation and coordination. Commodification permeates um, capitalism in many forms, including the commodification of labor, which implies a lot. And thirdly, capital is um, central. That means utilizing resources for investment in the present with the expectation of higher gains in the future, accepting credit besides using savings and returns. That means dealing with uncertainty and risk, as well as having profit and accumulation as aims. Change, 
growth and expansion are inscribed, uh, though in irregular rhythms with ups and downs interrupted by crisis. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God, says the Gospel of Mark. Through sermons, uh, visual imagery and scriptures, the moral doctrine of the Christian church shaped the views of the educated as well mentalities of the broad population in medieval Europe. It's true, this doctrine could concede that the useful role of um, merchants and the ethical value of work and property could also be interpreted very flexibly. But within this doctrine, the love of money was seen as a root of evil. And the conviction predominated that the gains of one person would usually imply losses by others. Within this worldview, there was much distrust against great wealth uh, and certain practices of merchants, uh, which after all included profit uh, seeking and competition. In the name of brotherly altruism, and selflessness, Christian morale have distrusted the resolute orientation towards one's own self-interest and opposed certain capitalist practices, particularly money lending for interests, which was seen and forbidden as usury, at least if practiced vis-a-vis -vis thy brother, that means members of one's own group, or religion, not, necess not necessarily vis-a-vis -vis others. Certainly, this rule could be circumvented in many ways. But well into the 16th and 17th centuries, a disposition that was either skeptical or hostile towards capitalism was dominant in Europe's uh, theologies, philosophies, and theories of society. The skepticism was uh, amplified by the republican humanism of the Renaissance uh, with its reliance on the rediscovered Aristotle and its claim to defend public virtues uh, and values against particularized self-interest, private wealth and corruption. But the widespread distrust and moral rejection and intellectual criticism have neither prevented nor perceptively, perceptively hindered the rise of capitalism in medieval Europe. Similar to other parts of the world, like parts of Arabia, China, South Asia, but a bit later than there, merchant capitalism asserted itself in Europe too. Long distance trade was leading on land and across the sea with merchants and merchant bankers as crucial actors. Most of them were pious Christians, I assume. They must have shared the religiously founded reservations against profit seeking and accumulated wealth. They accommodated to such prevailing attitudes to some extent by adopting a lifestyle and an imagery compatible uh, with religion, by donating heavily to charity, by creating foundations, and often also by making a final penance uh, in old age uh, through large transfer of wealth uh, to monasteries and churches. At the same time, they behaved like capitalists do. They were ready to accept high risk. They granted and received credits. They invested and competed with one another. They strove for profit and accumulated wealth, a lot of wealth. Particularly when combining trading with banking, 
they could become very rich and influential. They use different legal forms for their projects and enterprises, both in the Roman law and in the common law tradition. They invented new methods of transmitting, credit, crediting, paying, and computing, like bookkeeping a la Veneziana, as it was called in more northern parts of Europe. Most projects and enterprises were limited most projects and enterprises were limited in size and were short-lived, but some were already multi-branch and multi-local enterprises which sometimes survived the lifespan of the founders and were transmitted to heirs and um, others. Compared with other parts of the, like China, merchant capitalism in medieval Europe had, I think, two characteristics which deserve to be emphasized. On the one hand, merchant capital at some points and to a limited extent transcended into the sphere, from the sphere of distribution to the sphere of production. This happened in agriculture, for instance in Italy, already in the medieval period. This happened in mining, with its huge capital uh, requirements and often extensive um, plant operations based on wage work. And it happened in cottage industries. Uh, here and there, merchants began to exercise influence over artisans uh, and cottage workers, that is, over the producers of goods they then intended to market by advancing raw material uh, to the producers by placing orders and sometimes by providing tools. We find numerous examples for that in the history of the wool trade in northern Italy, in Flanders, in Brabant, starting in the 13th century at the latest, an early form of which of something we call later proto-industrialization. On the other hand, there were moves to finance capitalism. From the outset, banking transactions contained elements of speculation. They were usually settled to the extent that they arose by merchants along the way. But specialization in financial business also started, and banks began to emerge in Genoa since the 12th, in Venice since the 13th, in Tuscany since the early 14th century. There were already 80 banks in Florence in 1350, some of them with several branches in several European countries. They used the money deposited with them for financing businesses of different sort, but in addition, they issued bonds uh, to city governments, landed and manorial estates, and eventually also to the highest ranking spiritual and worldly rulers who were in constant need of money and found it, diffi found it difficult to wage their wars and fulfill their ceremonial needs and promote their territorial expansion. State formation and the origins of financial capitalism were closely connected, and this nexus provided a wave of prosperous urban citizens in high finance, a small elite, to establish their influence on politics, while simultaneously making their entrepreneurial success partly dependent on powerful rulers and their shifting political fortunes. This pattern continued over centuries. European capitalism, it seems, was not the first, but then became particularly dynamic already before 1500. Its dynamics were linked to and conditioned by the peculiar dynamics of Europe's political structure, which was defined by the plurality of um, competing, sometimes fighting, political units in contrast, for instance, to China and its comprehensive empire. 
this pluralistic political structure offered European capitalists particular incentives, opportunities, and influence. European expansion into the world since about 1500 had many motives and many driving forces. But the resources and the ambitions, the greed, and the enterprising spirit of West European commercial and finance, finance capitalists were no, bar, no doubt among these motives. From the 16th to the 18th century, capitalism gained a new design in overseas trade, in the colonies, and connected with this in the economic life of Europe. A new symbiosis between business and violence characterized capitalism during those centuries. Particularly outside Europe, but under the influence of European countries, as became evident in the many wars and raids, but also in the plantation system on the basis of unfree labor. Certainly, slavery was not a capitalist invention. But the capitalist plantation economy of Brazil, the Caribbean, and the southern regions of uh, North America triggered a huge expansion of slave trade and slavery. According to Marx, modern capitalism came into the world soaked in blood and filth as a result of violence and suppression. This, I think, is only partly true historically, but nonetheless a correct observation when one considers the connection between the rise of capitalism and colonization. And presently, this connection is very much researched. Within Europe, capitalism continued its expansion into the world of production, which was accordingly reshaped. Think of the different types of agrarian capitalism in Western Europe, England and the Netherlands, but also in the Eastern part, closely combined with structures of feudalism. Think of mining and metal producing industries. Think of the proto-industrial reorganization of cottage industry, Verlagswesen, in nearly all industrial regions of Europe. Productivity growth was one major consequence which decisively improved the life chances, even the survival chances of a growing population but new forms of inequality, dependence uh, also followed, which could not be realized without some violence and many social conflicts. The combination of merchant and finance capitalism with colonialism triggered innovations. The enterprise, a core element of modern capitalism, became more clearly profiled by gaining elements of a legal and political identity beyond the persons who founded and managed it. The Dutch Vereinigte Ostindische Company, VOC, founded in 1602, was just one, but a famous example of several firms founded for the purpose of colonial trade in several countries, especially in the Netherlands, in France, and England. An impressive capital, 6.5 million guilders, on the basis of shares, more than 200 shareholders with limited liability, power with a board of directors, sophisticated organization, with a transnational and transregional reach, a central office in Amsterdam, soon with about 150 employees, a diversified portfolio 
of trading activities, including some production units, for instance, uh, spinning mills in India. A very modern corporation, indeed. But it rested on the basis of political privilege and was mo a monopoly with extensive quasi-governmental quasi powers. The Dutch government had conferred on the VOC the right to operate all Dutch trading business east of the Cape of Good Hope, along with the authorization, I quote, to wage war, conclude treaties, take possessions of land, and uh, build fortresses. The VOC executed these rights, often in armed struggle with competitors from other countries. The distinction between conducting capitalist business and waging war was fluid. There were years in which the company apparently drew the major share of its income from the seizure of competing or enemy ships. The VOC held together until 1799, while its shareholders continuously changed. They could easily enter and leave the co corporation because they could sell and buy their shares on newly emerging stock markets, particularly in Antwerp, Amsterdam, and London. The shares of the monopoly companies engaged in colonial business represented a considerable part, um, a considerable portion of the commercial papers traded on stock exchanges uh, at all. Capital increasingly became a commodity and the speculative elements associated with it grew by leaps and bounds. Not only did the prospect, prospect of spectacular profits increase thereby, but so did the danger of great losses. Both the opportunities and the perils soon affected not just a small number of active, so to speak, professional trade capitalists, but an increasing number uh, of small and large investors from wide sections of the population, of the urban population in Western Europe, particularly in the big cities, metropolis. In the course of the 17th and 18th century, they learned how to try their luck on the stock exchange to bet, to invest, to speculate with perspectives and dangers. The downfall of the English South Sea Company in 1720 was preceded by a full-fledged uh, speculation mania. The British government had granted the company a monopoly on trade with South America even including all the rights to regions not yet discovered. The public expected huge gains. A run on shares set in. The share, of price ro the share price rose from 100 to 905 pounds within just a month. Broad segments of the population entrusted their money to the company and lost it when the bubble burst in the summer of 1720 and the share price went into free fall. <coughs> Sir Isaac Newton was among the victims and he is supposed to have said, I quote, I can calculate the motions of erratic stars uh, but not the madness of the multitude. The uh, macroeconomic and social consequences of such crises still remained limited compared with what they became in the 20th century. Yet, via stock market and speculation, large segments of society got their first introduction to the hopes and disappointments, the gains and the losses that capitalism so abundantly held in store for them. 
The early modern rise of finance capitalism did not only follow from growing credit needs of trade and production. Rather, the services provided by banks were deliberately requested by those in power, by city governments and ruling aristocrats, later on above all by the governments of the powerful territorial states establishing themselves by competing and sometimes fighting with one another. Step by step, the center of transnational finance capitalism moved to Western Europe, first to Antwerp and Amsterdam, later to London. In the Netherlands and in England particularly, capitalist principles affected social life beyond the economy. They influenced sociability, consumption, leisure activities, betting and sports, the relation between the sexes and the distribution of political power. In the 17th and 18th centuries, the Netherlands and England were the most capitalist countries in Europe and for that matter in the world. It's worthwhile to note that they were also the most prosperous countries and certainly also the freest uh, in Europe on the way to constitutional government and uh, a dynamic civil society. I started by discussing the skepticism against the trade and capitalism, anti-capitalist sentiments dominant in medieval Europe under the influence of Christian morale and other factors. To be sure, Reformation and Counter-Reformation brought about a more modern religiosity that stressed the worldliness of faith and contributed to an upgraded appreciation of work and um, profession. Max Weber has emphasized this, not without some justification. Still, it was less the Reformation, but rather the Enlightenment, uh, which brought about a reassessment uh, in the contemporary thought about capitalism and its reputation, at least among intellectuals and probably beyond. And the impact of the era's destructive um, wars, authors like Grotius, Hobbes, Locke, and Spinoza worked at redefining the virtues of civil society with a secularized thrust and informed by concerned with human rights, freedom, peace, and prosperity. In 1748, in a clear withdrawal from the old European mainstream, Montesquieu praised trade as a civilizing force that contributed to, con over to, contributed to overcoming barbarism, calming aggression, refining manners. Other authors followed a similar line, among them Bernard de Mondeville, David Hume, Condorcet, of course Adam Smith, West European thinkers above all. The common good, so when the thrust of these arguments can be promoted by the reasonable pursuit of self-interest. The advantage of the one need not be to the disadvantage of the others. Commerce and morality were not locked into an inevitable opposition. The market helps replace the war of passions with the advocacy of interests. Commerce was said to promote such virtues as diligence and persistence, uprightness, discipline. Overall, a fundamental affirmation of society's new capitalist tendencies was starting to emerge. It was expected not only that these capitalist tendencies would increase prosperity, but that they would also contribute to creating a new social order that was better 
for human cooperation, one without arbitrary uh, state interventions, with more respect for liberty and individual responsibility, and with the capacity for resolving conflicts through compromise instead of war. Certainly, these authors did not use the concept capitalism. It did not yet exist. Adam Smith wrote about commercial society. But basically, this was a legitimizing vision of capitalism as a civilizing force in the spirit of enlightenment. With respect to the appreciation by intellectuals and public opinion, capitalism had its best time in the second half of the 18th century. But again, there was a deep gap between reality and discourse. Now between the deep contradictions of capitalist reality and its utopian idealization in terms of do commerce and commercial society. I'm jumping ahead uh, by one century. In Werner Sombart's and Max Weber's analysis of capitalism, for instance, there was much confidence in the economic rationality of capitalism. But these authors did not regard capitalism anymore to be a carrier of human progress, moral improvement, and civilizational uplift. On the contrary, liberals like Max Weber feared the increasing rigidity of the system which he anticipated to threaten human freedom by coercing economic actors to function according to its increasingly compulsive uh, rules of relentless competition and growth or drop out altogether. Among conservatives, as well as on the left, capitalism was seen as an irresistible force of erosion. Custom was seen to be replaced by contract, Gemeinschaft by Gesellschaft, the traditional by the modern, social bonds by the market. On the right, anti-capitalism frequently went hand in hand with anti-liberalism and anti-Semitism, particularly since the Great Depression of the 1870s. The socialist critique of capitalism was different and the most powerful one. On the one hand, it attacked the exploitation of labor by capital, the increase of social inequality, the lack of a fair deal with the workers, as well as alienation and suppression at the workplace. On the other hand, it predicted the decline of capitalism due to its internal contradictions and its replacement by something new, namely socialism. Many of those who did not enjoy this perspective did not contest it either, but were fearful of it to come. This was the intellectual and social constellation in which the concept concept capitalism emerged, first as a critical and polemical concept, soon to be turned into an analytical tool. The concept capitalism emerged, one might say, as a concept of difference. It was used of double difference. It was used to identify and critically underline certain features of the present, then present, in contrast to what it was thought to have been in previous times and to what it might become under socialism in the future. So the contrast with a selectively commemorated past and the contrast with an imagined future was in a way constitutive for the emergent 
emergence of this concept capitalism. And in a way, one might say this mechanism is still working today when it comes to more basic discussions about capitalism. How can we explain this uh, change in the evaluation of capitalism between the late 18th and the late 19th or early 20th century? This change of mood uh, from appreciation to criticism. Let me pick out three relevant issues. First, while Adam Smith had known capitalism before industrialization, 19th century capitalism mainly spread in the form of industrial capitalism based on the factory system and wage labor en masse. Now the capitalist principle of commodification was fully extended into the sphere of work or labor. To the activities of human beings, that is, en masse, Work relations were becoming capitalist, and that meant they were dependent on changing market mechanisms and subject to ever stricter calculation and subordinated to the supervision by employers or managers. At the same time, industrial um, wealth was accumulated to an unprecedented degree due to the need uh, of large-scale fixed capital in mines, factories, railways, and other institutions of industrial capitalism. As a consequence, wealth differences became more visible and stricter controls of profitability over time were felt to be needed and practiced by employers and managers. The class difference had been built into capitalism as a potentiality from the start. Now it became more manifest. It could be directly experienced, widely observed, and critically discussed. This was the constellation, industrial capitalism with a factory system with large-scale capital accumulation and wage labor as a mass phenomenon. This was the constellation which served as the empirical base for the classic narratives of Marx and Engels and for the rise of labor movements. Second, innovations, technological and organizational innovations became now much more important in 19th century and more frequent under industrial capitalism than ever before. In other words, what Josef Schumpeter would later call creative destruction became now the rule. And a widely spread experience, factories pushed aside cottage work in the spinning of yarn and the weaving of clothes. Steamboats replaced traditional forms of tra transportation on rivers, canals, and oceans. Producers of, of electrical um, installations gained superiority over the providers of gas-based lighting. This was a process opening up new opportunities to many and new roads towards success. But there were also numerous losers and at the same time. Rise and fall, ascent and decline are mechanisms anchored right in the core of capitalism. Permanent competition, sustained insecurity, threatening dangers were institutionalized and resented. There were many losers. All this came in cycles with ups and downs, booms and busts. 19th century crisis impacted on large segments of the population. Its, its crisis helped to delegitimize capitalism and raise anti-capitalist resentment. And thirdly, 
there was the rise of expectations. Partly as a precondition, partly as a consequence of capitalist industrialization, previous patterns of social control were loosened. The standard of living was raised. Fast historical change was experienced. And human affairs clearly appeared, in fact, proved to be changeable. The level of education was raised. Public spaces emerged in which intellectuals and media played uh, uh, a dynamic, frequently a critical role. As a consequence, people became, people became less patient, more demanding, more critical. In a way, capitalism's critique followed from capitalism's success, something analyzed by Albert Hirschman, Hirschman as capitalism's propensity, propensity to undermine itself. All this had surfaced by the end of the 19th and the start of the 20th century, very much in contrast to the period of Adam Smith. When, while capitalism developed its strengths and powerfully expanded, expanded both internally into different spheres of life and externally uh, towards different parts of the world, at the same time its image darkened, its evaluation became, became increasingly pessimistic, its past and its present were criticized. Now since then, another um, century has passed, which has brought deep changes different from what Max Weber and its contemporaries could expect. There have been deep-reaching technological and organizational innovations, the digital revolution of recent decades among them. There has been an unprecedented expansion and differentiation of consumption, including mass consumption, but also socioeconomic inequalities which within our societies, as we know, have started to grow again since the 1970s. In this century of extremes, to quote Hobsbawm, people in Europe and elsewhere have experienced unprecedented social, political, and cultural upheaval, somehow related to capitalism, largely initiated by Europeans, but impacting on most other parts of the world as well, among them the deep crisis of capitalism in the interwar period, facilitating the rise of fascism and World War II. We also have experienced the rise of a powerful anti-capitalist alternative, the Soviet type of state socialism which in a way radicalized the rejection of capitalism in a very practical and effective way for decades before it lost, before it lost out in a worldwide conflict and imploded. Particularly in Europe and particularly in the north of this continent, more coordinated more organized, more regulated forms of capitalism were invented and put into reality with the help of organized interests, including organized labor, with the welfare state as its centerpiece. Much negotiation and, com and coordination and frequently framed by social democratic ideas. The beginning of organized capitalism, others prefer to speak of coordinated capitalism, date, 
the beginnings date back to the late 19th century and World War I. But it really flourished in the third quarter of the 20th century and proved to be very compatible with democracy, with representative democracy. But it has been questioned, though not at all destroyed, under more market radical, so-called neoliberal auspices in more recent decades, uh, which have been characterized by an unproportional rise of finance capitalism and financialization. In the latter part of the 20th and the early 21st century, globalization understood as an increasing interdependence, not an increasing convergence, proceeded with accelerated speed across borders between countries and world regions conditioned by and affecting large parts of capitalism which has become more transnational and global than ever before. And this, of course, poses an unresolved problem for any form of regulation and coordination by political means, since political power is still largely vested in competing national states or empires. The global dimension of present-day capitalism dramatically increases its destructive impact on the natural environment, including climate, a problem largely absent, or at least not, being, not, in the, not present in the observations and the consciousness of people in previous centuries, presently discussed sometimes under the heading of Anthropocene. Anthropocene. There are authors who use the concept capitalism with clearly positive overtones. For instance, economists in the tradition of the Chicago School and others. There are also numerous examples uh, of a primarily analytical, neutral use of the concept. So in the long and ongoing debate of economists and political scientists about varieties of capitalism, in this debate we usually distinguish between types of capitalism um, according to different relationships between market and state ranging from a relatively market radical model, especially in the US, to state capitalist forms, especially in East Asia, with different forms of coordinated and organized capitalism in combination with strong welfare states in the middle, especially Europe. Anyone who takes a serious look on the history of capitalism and in addition, knows something about life in past centuries that were either not yet capitalist or barely so, cannot, be, but, cannot but be impressed by the immense progress that has taken place in large parts of the world. In spite of its very unequal distribution, it has uh, also been progress for the huge masses of people who did not or do not belong to the well-situated upper strata, progress with respect to overcoming poverty, changing living conditions, consumption, gains in life's expectancy and health, opportunities for choice and freedom. It was progress, one might say, um, in retrospect, that would presumably uh, not have happened without capitalism's characteristic way um, of constantly stirring up things, pressing them forward and reshaping them. Thus far, alternatives to capitalism have proven inferior 
both with respect to the creation of wealth and to the facilitation of freedom. The downfall of the centrally administered state socialist economies in the last third of the 20th century uh, was in this respect a key process for evaluating the historical balance sheet of capitalism. Nevertheless, particularly in Europe, the concept continues most frequently to be used with skeptical or pessimistic overtones in a spirit of criticism or at least with a feeling of ambivalence with much sensitivity for the dark sides of the capitalist record. There are notably continuities in the criticism of capitalism. Take the Catholic social teaching as an example with its critique of the idolatry of the market and its rejection of radical capitalist ideology to quote from an encyclical, papal encyclica. The current pope, undoubtedly against the background of his experience in the global south, has again intensified the tone of the Catholic critique. Other examples of a discursive uh, continuity can be found in different currents, what I sh would like to call totalizing critique of capitalism that rejects capitalism as the epitome of modernity, at least Western modernity, or as the outright embodiment of evil. This type of fundamentalism is hard to discuss. And now, as in the 19th and 20th century, anti-capitalist criticism can be raised from standpoints both on the political left, for instance, by rejecting inequalities and dependencies coming with capitalist relations, or from the standpoint of the political right, with anti-liberal, anti-cosmopolitan nativist implications. Politically, capitalismus critique has been and is polyvalent. Some critiques of capitalism that were once at the center of attention have, however, moved to the margins. This is true for the classical in our part of the world, in, for the classical Marxist critique of capitalism as the site of alienation of labor and of the immiseration of the working class. In our parts of the world, the labor question, the Arbeiterfrage, has ceased to have the divisive and mobilizing effects it used to display in the 19th and the first part of the 20th century. But on the global level, it deserves to be rediscovered, given the massive spread of so-called informal labor and the conditions of capitalist exploitation in the global south. Other um, topics have moved to the foreground. Very concrete abuses are denounced, such as structured irresponsibility in the financial sector. Here, a lack of accountability has led to a widening gap, incidentally also in violation of one of capitalism's uh, central premises, a gap between deciding, between making decisions on the one hand, and answering to the consequences of decisions on the other. As a result, exorbitant profits for money managers are facilitated by public budgets too big to fail. Moreover, the contemporary critique uh, of growing inequality as a consequence of capitalism is becoming ever more urgent. Lamenting growing inequality blends into protest against 
infringements of distributive justice, which is how the critique becomes systemically relevant. Also lamented are the perennial insecurity, unrelenting acceleration processes, and extreme individualization that are inherent to capitalism and that may lead, if, counter, if countermeasures are absent, to the erosion of social welfare and neglect of public interest. Similar in the way it poses fundamental questions is the critique of capitalism's intrinsic dependence on permanent growth and constant expansion beyond the attained status quo, a dependence that threatens to destroy natural resources, environment, climate, and perhaps also cultural resources, solidarity, cohesion. These are resources that capitalism needs to survive, but increasingly exhausts and destroys. This in turn raises the anxious question of where the limits of the market and of venality lie or where on moral or practical, practical grounds they should be drawn. The historical overview, I think, offers strong arguments for the case that there is a need for such boundaries for the, that capitalism, in other words, cannot be allowed to permeate everything, but that it needs non-capitalist widerlager abutments in society, culture, and the state. But it tends to erode them. At the most fundamental level, the discrepancy between the claim of democratic politics on the one hand and the dynamics of capitalism that evades democratic politics on the other remains an enduring problem. There are, as I said, defenders of capitalism in the public debate and many good arguments which demonstrate its achievements, its alliance with progress, its beneficial effects over the centuries. But by and large, the critical, skeptical, pessimistic arguments, connotations, and overtones dominate both, both in public debates and in relevant parts of the social sciences. Books on post-capitalism are selling well, with frequent references to the impact of digitalization, predicting the imminent end of capitalism as we know it. Clearly, at any point in time, very different and even contradictory assessments of capitalism have coexisted and competed. This is why it's hard to generalize. If we generalize nevertheless, we might conclude that over the centuries in Europe, the rise, the breakthrough, finally the triumph of capitalism have taken place in an intellectual and mental climate of pronounced capitalismus critique, criticism of capitalism. A basic discrepancy, a whiff of schizophrenia, a paradox. If this conclusion is correct, one may wonder why these skeptical and critical sentiments and convictions have not hindered or handicapped the real rise of European or European-sponsored capitalism more than was apparently the case. An achievement with bad conscience, a typical contradiction between basis and superstructure, a centuries-old hypocrisy not unknown in the history of public morale, but one can offer more constructive hypothesis, and with that I want to conclude and hold that widespread criticism of capitalism has indirectly contributed to its permanent change and reform, as well as indirectly and inadvertently 
to its survival and success over the centuries. One could show in detail that ideas and discourses of capitalismus critique, once they manage to be translated into social and political energy, have led to reforms which civilized capitalism to some extent, making it more con compatible with human needs. This then has enhanced its social acceptance and ultimately its capability to survive. But, and it's neither guaranteed nor excluded that this mechanism will continue to work in the future. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.